privilege for me to be out here and for all of us to hear about it and get exposed to what she's done. Um, it's really a model book. It, it has a, an argument and advanced it clearly, and uh, the execution in all of the chapters was, I think, I think uh, tremendous. What we thought is that um, because it's likely to be a topic outside, you know, the, the, the learning and study of so many of us in our day, um, I, I just thought it would be nice for um, me to take a few minutes to interview Anne about what she's tried to do in the book and then to give you a, a, a maximum amount of time to ask your own questions. Um, so just to begin, um, I, 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 I think it's important for them to know um, what, uh, what uh, place psychoanalysis, the topic of your book, once had in this law school. Uh, and part of, of your book, it, it tells a history of the engagement of lawyers and law professors in particular with the, uh, the study of psychoanalysis. Uh, so I wonder, before we get into kind of more, even more contentious questions about um, why psychoanalysis lost its centrality and what's had to our, our, our intellectual culture more broadly, I wonder if you could just give us a sense of how important it was in this very institution. Um, so I thought that would be a good place to begin, just, just so they understand that, that this, this isn't peripheral in the history of this law school. But yeah. They walk around this building, see names, uh, rooms named after various individuals who, in fact, wrote a prior version of this book, uh, yeah. Imperial. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but we're deeply yeah. and, and concerned and personally invested in, in the relevance of psychoanalysis to the modern thinking about law. Yeah, so I ha thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, Susan, students, and others who I know here. Um, so I have a chapter on the history of law and psychoanalysis, and at the end, there's a section on what I call the Yale School, because Yale was so central in developing and disseminating ideas about law and psychoanalysis in the 1960s and 70s. Um, I would say the central figure there was Joe Goldstein, who some in this room actually may have known. Um, and. Uh, he was uh, really instrumental in developing psychoanalytic ideas in the law, primarily in the areas of family law and child custody and in the areas of criminal law. I he wrote some that. seminal articles. He brought in Anna Freud, uh, Freud's daughter from England, um, to teach a series of classes on child custody and eventually culminated in a book uh, called Beyond the Best Interest of the Child, which was by uh, Goldstein, Anna Freud, and, uh, and Jay Katz, who was also on, who was a psychoanalyst on the faculty here, didn't have a JD. Um, so <coughs> the, 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 we're in a different world where a psychoanalyst without a JD is on the Yale Law School faculty. Um, Alan Stone similarly was a psychoanalyst on the Harvard Law School faculty at the time. So the three of them, Goldstein, Freud, and Solnit, developed it was a series of books, starting with Beyond the Best Interest of the Child, which really did path-breaking work in the area of child custody. And to bring it up to today, I mean, this is part of our uh, the history of psychoanalysis of this law school. Um, and Alstott and Doug Mejane uh, are spearheading, and I'm also involved, a, um, an effort to uh, to redo or update or I don't know, but really you know, in a transformative way, the Goldstein Freud and Solnit work. So um, we're in uh, partnership with the Yale Child Study Center in doing that. Um, I will I will note that I will note that um, when the psychoanalysts were doing their work here at Yale Law School, they were doing it in partnership with the Yale Child Study Center, which continues to be very psychoanalytic. Um, and that's why the, the program, the, the project that I'm on, um, is also in conjunction with the Yale Child Studies, and I can talk more about that if you'd like. But um, 
Hillary Clinton, when she was here, was also um, involved in the kind of interplay of the Yale Study Center and the Yale Law School. So what went on here psychoanalytically was part of a broader interdisciplinary effort and uh, kind of world that uh, I think um, has waned and is perhaps in the midst of a renaissance. So, um, Great. Well, well, let's let let me press you on that last. Yes, on the Renaissance part. I have, have, have not noticed the, <laughs> the signs of it, but but I, I would like it to happen as someone, as as you know, is very interested in, in the intellectual history of psychoanalysis and its bearing on thinking about ourselves and our social world. Um, so, I mean, could you give a sense? I mean, assuming most of the reason why. <coughs> Psychoanalysis became, you know, peripheral to, to non-existent at this law school at most. Um, if, if the reasons were kind of, you know, general, there, if the general culture shifted away from psychoanalysis, and really the the interests of psychologists themselves, especially in universities, shifted very radically. Um, why did that happen? And and. And, and, and then, because you've raised it, what are the signs you, you see of a renaissance in, of, of interest in, in psychoanalysis? Because you know, without it, you, you've got a, a kind of heroic project of recovery yeah. of, of an approach that people you know, believe has been left dead at the side of the road. Um, and it would be great if actually, it, you know, we can, we, it's, it's not, and we can revive it, and we have a different starting point than many might think. So a couple of, couple of things. One, the word dead comes up a lot as an analysis. Brian is dead. I, I'm often told when I say I'm doing a project on long psychoanalysis, the response is frequently, oh, you know, Freud is dead. And I'm like, do you think I didn't notice that? <laughs> uh, or notice that, you know, credibility of psychoanalysis has uh, waned over the years. Um, it's as though they're, you know, informing me of something I hadn't noticed. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, um, I want to say two things. I want to say one, um, yes, psychoanalysis has, um, is, has suffered, has declined. Um, I would say it's due in large measure to uh, the rise of biological psychiatry um, and the successes that scientific psychology has had, neuroscience, um, the advent of medications, shorter treatments. I think it's also due in large part to managed care and um, the financing for psychotherapy and for psychoanalysis. It was due um, to a cultural backlash in the 60s and 70s from feminists and others who um, took issue with some of the less attractive parts of traditional Freudian psychology, that women are inferior ways or that homosexuality is a pathology, those kinds of um, ideas. And, uh, and then it was just the arrogance of the psychoanalytic community. One, that they thought they could solve the world's problems, including social problems, um, but also that their form of treatment was the only treatment. Um, so uh, yes, it's, it's died in a sense um, uh, as an intellectual, I think you know, in intellectual circles, in certain intellectual circles it's died. It stayed alive, <coughs> though, in the humanities. Um, and so if one does interdisciplinary work or one works in the humanities, you will see um, continuing, interesting, lively uh, work being done. Um, also, when we think of psychoanalysis, we think of Freud, which is, this is my book is in the so-called Freudian tradition, um, but Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis is also very much alive and well in the humanities. Um, so that having been said, I'm also going to say it's not dead. And it's not dead in a couple of ways. One, it's not dead um, as a treatment. Um, um, well, let me first say, you know, uh, Auden said about Freud, I think back, you know, soon after he, I don't know when exactly it was, but you may know the year. But um, he said about Freud that um, as a man, he was dead, but uh, he was also a, a whole climate of opinion. I think that was something along those lines that he's living on as a 
uh, in ideas. And so in a sense, it's about the success of psychoanalysis that we take for granted so many of the ideas, like the unconscious, like the fact that early childhood experiences affects us, like uh, repression, or I mean, we could go on and on, sort of the, the kind of common everyday, what we think of now as almost common sense ideas, really stem from psychoanalysis. And indeed, part of the effort of this book is to draw some connections to what we think of as scientific psych cognitive psychology and the work that's being done by behavioral law and uh, economists and, uh, and also just more generally by legal scholars interested in incorporating cognitive psychology into the science, into the law, because of course they're studying the unconscious too. Now, if you approach a cognitive psychologist and say, oh, I'm doing the unconscious as a psychoanalyst, um, you won't get a happy response, actually, or you won't get a friendly response. Um, it will tend to be, you know, we study the cognitive unconscious. And uh, psychoanalysts study the, what we call the dynamic unconscious. And there's, there's a divide. Um, but it's not actually, uh, it, there are points of connection between the two. So we think of the cognitive unconscious as uh, often it's uh, described as the, the part of our minds that's operating when we drive a car and we're sort of not paying attention but we're using our cognition to um, in our movements and so on. Um, and uh, so uh, it's fast thinking in Kahneman's phrase, right? Um, the ways in which we just quickly and unconsciously come to it. Now that's, that actually is a kind of cognitive thinking. That's not a psychodynamic <coughs> conscious because, and how do we know? We know it because if you're driving your car and the red light flashes on, you know, uh, some warning signal comes up. You pay attention, you slow down, you're suddenly, you're suddenly now controlling your actions, your movements in a way you weren't when it was just probably you were processing it unconsciously. The psychodynamic, that's what Freud called the pre-conscious. It's an area of thinking that's available for us to look at and see. This, the dynamic unconscious is actually harder to get at. And it's dynamic. It's emotional, not just cog cognitive. It's full of aggression and uh, love. And it moves, it's in movement, and it also has a, a kind of um, resistance to being known. And we see that, for example, another distinction is the area of discrimination where much is being done on uh, cognitive, you know, cognitive psychology, interesting work on unconscious affects or implicit affects. And, uh, one of the unanswered questions in the area of discrimination is, well, when, we, when the warning light goes on, when we point out there's, you're, you're harboring discriminatory ideas you don't even, you're not aware of, when the warning light goes on, it's still difficult to change. It's still very hard sometimes to even see and certainly to change. So. There, uh, and from a psychoanalytic point of view, one would want to ask questions about, well, what resistances are operating there? What ways in which is it, are there parts of our minds that are keeping things about ourselves from being known? So, uh, so I guess that would be, you know, I'm sorry, I'm speaking for too long, about the way in which psychoanalysis um, is is still are, is still deeply relevant to our lives today, and indeed, actually, because it's uh, more of a humanities field than a scientific field, I'd say it's actually crucial that we be looking to it as an interdisciplinary uh, area um, going forward in the law. No, that that's exactly. I mean, in the direction I want I wanted to to ask about this. Uh, so. Just, just to, to tell everyone, you know, this book um, has a, a, a kind of general part and then a, a, a part that offers a series of examples from different from different areas of, of the law. Um, and you know, the, the the general part, you know, is is really um, you know, centered on the claim that law um, has to make a certain number of assumptions about agency. Uh, and and its impairment. 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, psychoanalysis is a, a one way of thinking about those those uh, incredibly important topics. But you've already begun to get into the fact that there are today more popular um, ways of thinking about agency and its impairment. So we, we really want to hear about the, let's say, the, what's distinctive mm -hmm. about psychoanalysis and maybe what's superior. Mm -hmm. um, and I and so I want I wonder if you'd say something about that um, even more than you have, and also address what I think for many people will be you know the, fir the first area in, in law that that we'll think of, which is behavioral law and economics, mm -hmm. which has made it, you know, has been very showy, let's say, in the last generation in claiming to discover that agency is not an errantly rational. Yeah. Um, now, I was, I was interested in, the, in, in this particular angle because in, in the conclusion of the book, you, you really tell a much more conciliatory mm -hmm. story about the way psychoanalysis and this, this emergent uh, field, popular field, could could complement yeah. each other, um, and so I just wonder if you say something in general about, uh, or, or with respect to yeah. behavioral law and economics, yeah. about what what what's the distinctive work that a psychoanalytic perspective um, does to help us conceptualize agency and its impairment in the law. Right. So I think that um, I, I I tend to think of. Um, cognitive psychology, which is basically what behavioral law and economics draws from, um, as reinforcing a rationalist paradigm, um, uh, holding more firmly to it than, a, than psychoanalysis does. So, um, one of and and so a psychoanalytic um, understanding of agency to me is just a much richer much broader. I, I don't think cognitive psychology has grand ambitions to describe the human mind or human behavior generally. It, it's low ambition in that sense. It's trying to understand how people think in, you know, in particular settings and to offer ways in which to uh, reinforce rationality, nudge people towards rationality, de-bias people um, in that regard. Psychoanalysis has a broader uh, and richer way of understanding people. So I came to psychoanalysis when I was teaching family law. And I got to the subject of intimate partner violence. And um, I was trying to teach, I was trying to teach uh, the phenomenon of uh, women who don't, um, or I'm, I'm using woman here, it doesn't have to be a woman, um, but uh, the majority of victims of intimate violence are women, um, but the, the victim um, doesn't immediately leave an abuser. Um, the, almost, it's a, it's a myth that they don't leave because they do, but often it takes a while, often they don't want to prosecute, um, and sometimes they return after having left. And so from uh, the perspective that I was, that my casebook was taking, it was hard to understand this one way from a sort of cognitive psychology perspective would be to look at it and say, well, that person's actually being rational. They're making a decision based on children or money or a, a fear of future harm. Or the alternative approach was, well, there's something actually mentally ill about uh, these victims, that they suffer from battered women's syndrome. Um, and I found it just very, very unsatisfying. Uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really understand the phenomenon of domestic violence and how the law should treat it with that kind of thin view of human nature. And so psychoanalysis would ask um, really about a number of dimensions to it. One, or, or would, tell, would be able to tell us a lot more about what's going on there. One is how love and violence can become intimately connected in a person's mind, and often deriving from early childhood. Um, either exposure to domestic violence or being a victim of violence as a child. And these kind of, the ways in which children internalize relationships and uh, have that have long lasting effects on them comes out in psychoanalysis in many ways. We talk about transference, the ways in which um, important relationships gets, tra get 
get trained, you know, emotions around them, get transferred onto other, uh, other relationships, um, the ways in which individuals will resist or repress um, the kinds of aggressions they're feeling. The very idea of ambivalence, the idea that um, love and hope and violence can be commingled in a person's life um, are all things that psychoanalysis can tell us something about. Um, there's also, for example, the law of confessions, another area where uh, I think psychoanalysis is something very important to offer. We're all aware now, science mm -hmm. can tell us that false confessions are relatively frequent. Um, and, but psychoanalysis can explain why um, people either, uh, either what might look like um, voluntary confessions are in fact not voluntary, or why people would falsely confess. Um, it's actually a puzzle for behavioral on, um, economic folks. Why people confess at all? Why would somebody confess to a crime? I mean, maybe you could say, well, there were rational reasons for it. They thought they'd get a lighter sentence. So they were, you know, they were making some kind of calculations. Um, or uh, you know, there was, they just wanted to get out of jail, or they were young, or there might have been, um, uh, they might have been mentally impaired in some way. Um, but nevertheless, confession itself is something of a puzzle, and psychoanalysts have, have written about it for decades, um, the compulsion to confess. And um, the chapter in the book on confessions here looks at the ways in which we don't see how interrogation plays upon some of the deepest psychological uh, uh, phenomena. So for example, the phenomenon of um, false sympathy when an interrogator uh, develops a relationship of false sympathy with a, uh, an accused really is playing, you know, how do we understand that effect? Well, it's playing upon transference feelings, deep emotional attachment feelings, and in many ways, uh, one could say, oh, is overriding the uh, rational decision-making powers of an individual. We might have concerns under Miranda about the coercive nature of um, false sympathy. The same thing with degradation, which can play upon deep uh, uh, forms of uh, self-destructive feelings and conflicts and even masochism. And then, of course, there's trickery, which is just on its own unbelievable that we allow trickery, which, you know, lying by the police to defendants. Um, but trickery can really play upon an individual's sense of unconscious guilt. Some people might actually confess to a crime, this is a false confession, because they're guilty about something else. So that, I, the idea of unconscious displacement of guilt is from a scientific psychology, it's too complex a matter, really. Science isn't ready for it. It's not ready for those kinds of uh, emotion, that emotional dynamic. It can't really, it doesn't have the capacity to study them in any uh, really nuanced way. And so in, in some sense, psychoanalysis is the best we have. We have 100 years of clinical work in psychoanalysis that can teach us something about <clears throat> this richer portrait of human nature. So I don't know if that, no, would... that that's, that's That's tremendously helpful. And, and you know, it, it leads to, it allows me to ask the question I really wanted to ask. I mean, just to editorialize, even though yeah. it's not my book talk, I mean, I agree with you that <laughs> m much of what you read and in behavioral law and economics seems to be about relatively, um, let's call them superficial foibles that the, you know, beneficent choice architect, so-called, can, you know, design things to allow us to overcome, to realize our ends, as if we actually had chosen our ends. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the psychoanalytic picture is darker, it's more disturbing. Yeah. Uh, it's about how we're, we're out of control and haven't, haven't always chosen our ends, um, or, you know, we've been led by pathology to pursue ends that we would reject if we had more distance uh, on, on ourselves. But this then raises, like, this puzzle about some things you say in the book. Um, so at times you say the law is liberal. Uh, it has to make an assumption that we're free and <coughs> rational 
most of the time mm -hmm. that we really make our choices and therefore, like in a criminal setting, can, can rightly be held accountable for them. But I have the thought that a, a psychoanalytic perspective maybe is, is more challenging for that basic assumption. I mean, if he's famous for anything, it, it, Sigmund Freud is famous for showing us that we're not, the ego is not master in its own house. And, and I just, I, I, I wonder why you, is it strategic or it, is there something really at stake in saying ultimately the law has to be liberal and make these assumptions about, let's say, our ba the basic rationality of agents. And then maybe it intervenes, uh, you know, helpfully from that point. Yeah. Um, or or sh sh could you have gone a different so, way? Uh, so um, the ego is not master in its own house. Um, I think comes up against where it was their ego shall be. Yes. Right. So um, Freud, what, what, Freud was a pessimist. He didn't, you know, he looked darkly on us um, and saw a lot of conflict and self-destructiveness and aggression. And, you know, really. You don't have to look far out into the world to see uh, manifestations of that. But he was also, an, I mean, there was an optimistic side to him. He thought that um, we could transform, or psychoanalysis could transform uh, misery into ordinary unhappiness. I, that's optimistic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, that's how I feel. Like maybe I can transform law from something that I think has very can have very unjust consequences to something that's just um, as a pra as a pragmatic matter workable. Um, yeah, it's a book. It's a pragmatic book. It's pragmatic in two ways. One. I don't think we can overturn all of law. It's not what I want particularly. So this book, what I say is I'm looking for the gaps where law and lived experience, uh, where those gaps are the greatest between law and lived experience. And I see them primarily in the family law and criminal law areas, but many of you could think of areas, perhaps other areas where you see these gaps arise, where you're thinking, you know, especially for students in class, well, uh, wait a minute, what about this? You know, people really are behaving that way? Is that really the motivation? Um, uh, so it's pragmatic in that sense, but there's a deeper pragmatism to the endeavors. I, I think that liberal liberalism, as it operates in the law, is pragmatic, and I, I go back to Holmes for this, that Holmes himself, although he developed the idea of the reasonable person, was actually well aware in the common law of the role of the unconscious in human life, and was uh, in some ways driven towards a behavioral perspective, because how could you deal with this unconscious? How could you, we can't manage it. It's almost too much to say, you know, we're, we're being driven by forces beyond our control. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's a pragmatic stance. So it's pragmatic in, in the sense that we have to believe in our legal fictions. We have to uh, act as if uh, we are rational human beings um, in law in order for us to simply move, in order for us to operate as a, as a society. Um, but psychoanalysis also tells us, psychoanalysis is itself somewhat pragmatic. Um, yes, it's, it's radical in certain ways, but uh, it's not radical in others. And I, I could go into to some of those, but the one that's most important is that it itself is about the exercise of reason to control unconscious forces. That's what happens in a treatment. You, that's, that was the goal, right? It's the exercise of bringing ego to bear on the id. And, uh, and so um, it, too, has a fundamental faith in human agency and in the capacity of human uh, agents of our own uh, agentic powers to control and to understand and control deeper currents of love and aggression. Um, so both of them have, are kind of at a crossroads or kind of a pragmatic accommodation of a commitment to human agency and, and reason, and also an understanding of our deeper, what I talk about is more romantic um, sides. Uh, yeah, so. Great.
But it's, you know, I, I, I want to ask one last question that's selfish on two counts. First, that I'm eating into their time, yeah. but, but also because you know, this reflects my own views and so forth. But um, agree completely that for, for, for Freud himself, there's, there's, there's a project of liberation in some sense, and, yeah. and, and restoring rationality to, to, you know, more of a place that at least for many individuals, um, and that's the kind of treatment. Um, the question is, you know, what are the conditions under which that's going to be possible? Yeah. And um, there was one school of thought, you know, people refer to it as the marriage of Marx and Freud, that, yeah. that claim that actually much uh, irrationality is not not due to you know, invariant features of the human psyche, but social organization in in some complex interaction with with the you know the psyche. And if if there's any part of that, that that's true, it's also relevant to law because law is the way we institute social order or or you know poorly instituted. So from from the perspective of this vein of of, of social theory, you might think that an engagement between law and psychoanalysis would, would not solely focus on, let's say, areas of the individual, of the, of the law in which kind of, you know, individual rationality and yeah. its impairment is at stake, but yeah. actually a much broader totally project. And I just wonder, you know, is that, could that be a next volume, or I mean, how would we think about that? Or are there also signs of life in the dead corpse of, 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 of this, of the know, Frankfurt School? Of, Whoever, you know, whoever, oh, whoever, I, I won't have any friends left by the time I finish the second volume. Um, <laughs> you'll be my friend. <laughs> um, so, uh, what is in this book, along along those uh, lines, in addition to exactly what you say, which is this is very focused on in how to change doctrine, how to reform doctrine, how to reform our regulatory structure. Is a more institution a call for institutional change? It, it's not as obvious in the book, but um, part of when you ask, you know, where is it possible to live a more psychoanalytically formed life? Um, we're not all going to go uh, and see an analyst five days a week and lie on the couch. It's not a reasonable thing to expect in today's world, uh, or in any world. Um, but we can live a life of self-reflection. We can incorporate psychoanalytic values into our personal lives or into our social lives. And indeed, there might be an imperative to do so, to think about uh, the ways in which human agency operates under constraints and to reflect on what those constraints might be. And we might think about reforming institutions to do that. So for example, uh, schools, prisons, the, and if I think of that because I think of family and children and I think of criminal law, those are the areas that I think of where um, we might, and, and so let's, let me just take the intimate partner violence as an example. There are many people now who are doing work with intimate partner violence, and this is on a, both in a small scale but also in a systemic sense that are looking for alternatives to adjudication and to criminal punishment through restorative justice models. Um, and so it's, there's some glimmers of it in the book, but 